Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the 92nd Street Y, and thanks for coming out in the rain, but it's a very special event. My name is Sue Solomon. I'm the Senior Associate Director of 92Y Talks, and we are delighted you're all here uh, for two very special guests. I hope you will check out our website at some point. There are a lot of uh, other interesting events coming up. Uh, look, I won't, I won't do the spiel now. Uh, our moderator tonight is a filmmaker, writer, and scientific researcher. He's the creator of the documentary series Hamilton's Pharmacopedia and a correspondent for Vice News on HBO. A frequent contributor to Harper's Magazine, he studies the chemistry and pharmacology of psychedelics at the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. And joining him is a man that's kind of a superstar in his world. In 2010, Time Magazine named, uh, named our special guest tonight one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He's the author of eight New York Times bestsellers and a longtime contributor to the New York Times Magazine. He also teaches writing at Harvard and the University of California, Berkeley, where he is the John S. and James L. Knight Professor of, of Science Journalism. His new book, How to Change Your Mind, which is available in the lobby, as you all know, uh, has been described as a triumph a participatory journalism and a brilliant and brave investigation into the medical and scientific revolution taking place around psychedelic drugs and the spellbinding story of his own life-changing psychedelic experiences. Please join me in welcoming Hamilton Morris and Michael Pollan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on a rainy night. Wow. And thank okay. you, Hamilton, for doing this. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. All right. Well, I really enjoyed the book. I've read it twice now. And I've thought a lot about ways to approach this issue because it's such a politically precarious subject that there's endless debate about how to appropriately talk about psychedelics. And one thing that I noticed that you do, and something that you note in many of the people that you profile, is that you're approaching them from a, a sort of naive position where you didn't know very much about them at all, you were unaware of their potential, but then you saw this scientific research and that totally changed your mind and your perception of these substances. And, uh, and that is the case for a number of the psychiatrists that you profile as well. Um, but I've been following your work for a while. And you know, I think actually in the mid 90s, you wrote a piece for Harper's that was uh, about Jim Hogshire that I think is one of the best things ever written about the war on drugs. So it's clear that you actually have you know, harbored a sort of understanding that the war on drugs is a problem for decades. And, psychoactive drugs appear in most of your books. They're described at least in passing in Omnivore's Dilemma. There's a section of Botany of Desire dedicated to cannabis. So, and then you mentioned in passing in this book, you know, I tried mushrooms three times when I was in my late 20s. So I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, were you truly naive? Did you truly <laughs> not know? Or, or was I faux naive? Well, on the subject of psychedelics, uh, definitely naive. Uh, I, had, I did not use them at the age-appropriate stage of life <laughs> when I was 18 or 20, 22. Uh, I was really frightened of them. Uh, I came of age when the scare stories were really what you heard. I mean, I was a little too young for the, the height of, you know, of interest in them, but by the time I, they, were, they swam into my consciousness, there were the stories about, you know, people kids staring at the sun till they go blind, and um, that they LSD scrambled your chromosomes. There was a lot of disinformation out there in the beginning in 1965. And I was 10 in 1965, so that's kind of, that was my training. And, uh, and I was more credulous then than I guess than I am now. On drugs in general, though, I have been, you're, you're absolutely right that I've had a long-standing interest in, I mean, everything plants do for us, right? which is food, which is beauty, and which is, most curiously of all, 
we use plants, and every culture on Earth, with one exception, as far as I know, has used some plants or fungus, mushrooms, to change consciousness. And in, in different ways, subtle ways, like, you know, as subtle as coffee, uh, caffeine, but then in these pr more profound ways. And the article you're referencing comes, is from 1997, and it was uh, called Opium Made Easy. And I was growing uh, opium in my garden, um, which uh, I thought was, you know, okay and legal. I mean, because they're just opium poppies. You see them everywhere. But I learned that if you, if you know that those opium poppies can be turned into opium, that state of knowledge makes you a, a federal, you know, a, a, that you're, you're breaking the law, federal crime. And so anyone who read this article actually could no longer grow opium poppies. <laughs> In fact, anyone who read the first paragraph could no longer grow opium poppies without uh, risking uh, the drug war. And it was at the height of the drug war, um, 97, and it, what became a kind of curious, I was looking for a garden column. I was writing columns about the garden and, and adventures I was having in the garden, and a friend gave me Jim Hogshire's book. This was an underground press book uh, called um, Opium for the Masses, right? That's right. And it was a great little, oh, did you know you can grow your own opium and turn it into a tea or a tincture or whatever you want? And by the way, you can get the seeds at the garden center and you can, uh, uh, you know, in fact, you can even buy dried poppy heads at the florist shop and turn those into a tea. And I thought, oh, this would be a cool story. And an editor at Harper sent it to me, actually, Paul Tuff. And then I interview him, and I figure I'll write about him and what's going on in my garden, and then he gets arrested. And, <laughs> and, he's, and the feds throw the book at him, and all they have as evidence is a box of dried poppy heads that he got at a florist shop in Seattle. And so suddenly I was really nervous about what I was doing because I had been tied to him and uh, I was doing the same thing, <laughs> more or less. And so it became a piece about the drug war and how fucked up the drug war was, is. And um, so I had a political interest in drugs and then I had this ethno-botanical interest in drugs. Uh, and I wrote about cannabis. Um, but what was the drug in Omnivore's Dilemma? I thought it was like antibiotics. Well, there's that, yeah. But you mentioned McKenna and Stamets and uh, Silicon. Oh, in the mushroom chapter, right. Passing this on to me. Yeah, yeah, you're them. right. So it is, it's, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's a very curious human desire, though. I mean, we get the, the, the fact that we would want drugs that would relieve pain. We get that. And drugs that would help us stay awake. We get that. But then you have these really profound ones that change consciousness in radical ways that leave us kind of vulnerable to, you know, um, attack or predation or whatever. And what are they for? And I've always been curious in that, about that question. Yeah. Me As too. apparently are you, yeah. <laughs> but I think there's different ways of approaching this topic and that is one way that I've always gravitated toward, finding somebody who is wronged by the war on drugs. Yeah. He was a writer. His life was destroyed. Last I heard, he's homeless. I mean, he was truly- This is Hogshire? Hogshire, yeah. Wow. His life was truly destroyed by this arrest, and it's very tragic. He didn't do anything wrong. And then you, if you um, highlight the injustice, then that's one way of communicating yeah. that this is a mistake. But you chose a different strategy with how to change your mind. So what was your- Well, you know, I often write from a position of naivete. Um, I really like, writing that story. I mean, in a way, that's the master narrative of all my books, is moving from a position of, you know, I'm usually an idiot on page one, and, and you go with me and you learn things. And I've, it's always occurred to me, and I feel this way when I read nonfiction, I don't like to be lectured at. I like to learn with the writer. And so one of the reasons that I kind of finally said I'm done with food for a while is, I was an expert now. I had become, you know, I, I was like you are on psychedelics. And I had lost that, that privileged position of being able to write uh, from a position of doubt, reluctance, skepticism, and naivete into uh, gradually knowing more and more and more. And I, I really like taking um, readers on that journey. And it's not something you can fake. Um, now, in a way, you're being coy because when you sit down to write page one, where you're 
an idiot, you actually know a lot more than you're saying at that point. And so you could argue that there's something a little disingenuous about that. But anyone who's ever told a joke waits, doesn't start with the punchline, right? I mean, this is the nature of storytelling. You, you, you find your place and you begin, you begin the story there and then you move through to a state of uh, knowledge or, you know, revelation. Right. I guess what I'm getting at is that your emphasis, of course, is on the scientific, medical, psychiatric mm -hmm. understanding of psychedelics. And that is one of many different ways to approach this issue. Of course, yeah. there's an entire shamanic world, there's an entire black market world, there's underground therapy, which you do get into, um, and then there's the entire history of chemistry and pharmacology, which is, um, and I am aware that you can't cover all of these different subjects, so I'm curious why this particular area was the one that you gravitated toward. Uh, because science has an authority in our culture that nothing else has. Um, you know, for good or bad, uh, and that for me, and I think for the audience, discovering that um, serious scientists, uh, you know, at prestigious universities were studying psychedelics uh, became a license to take them more seriously, I think. Um, you're always looking for, you know, sources of authority when you're writing journalism. And I knew I was writing, I mean, I don't write for people in the psychedelic community obviously, because there are people who know a lot more about it than I do. Um, I'm writing for people who maybe have no experience of psychedelics, uh, and I'm trying to bring a, a, a general reader to a topic that they have a lot of resistance for, uh, about. And, um, and so science is uh, a very powerful signifier that, oh, this is, this is worth taking seriously. Um, and I also just thought that was, you know, as you suggest, there are many different lines you can take through a subject. And I didn't deal very much with the shamanic world. You know, I didn't do the, you know, Peru, ayahuasca, or even go to Mexico to do psilocybin. I did them here. Um, and that's really interesting, and I think it's a whole other book. Um, but I think to get them, to get the subject taken really seriously, um, the Virgils I chose, who were these scientists, people like Roland Griffith, you know, really terrific scientists doing something at great risk, you know, they, 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 there was enormous reputational risk for them to get into psychedelics, was um, uh, the way I chose. You know, there, there are many paths through a book. Um, and uh, for me, that was, and also it, it had explanatory power. Um, you know, that they were developing theories on why it was working, that they were, Robin Carhart Harris was taking fMRI images of brains of people on psilocybin and LSD and beginning to develop theories on why it worked. So the, following the path of science gave me um, uh, a lot of, um, it opened up a lot of interesting doors. Uh, so you could look at therapy, you could look at neuroscience, you could look at um, history, because there was this history of research that got aborted in the, in, in the 60s. Um, so it was really, you know, I mean, we're talking about a rhetorical strategy, basically. Yeah. And you said that you weren't writing it for the psychedelic community, but of course the psychedelic community did read Took it. Took an interest, and yeah. And were extremely opinionated about it. Yeah. Do you, relative to the food world, how, how has your experience been with the psychedelic people? <laughs> psychedelic people, it just conjures images, doesn't it? <laughs> um, my sense is, and you, you tell me if I'm wrong, my sense is they've been very um, uh, positive about the book. You know, some of them will say, well, I didn't learn anything from it, but, um, which is fine. Um, I, they, they taught me a lot, you know. Um, that's how it works in journalism. But um, I think many people felt that, I, I've heard many people say that this, that this book legitimized what they were doing in the eyes of civilians. And, you know, I heard from many people, I finally had a book I could give my parents and, um, and help them understand. And then there were the people, the parents, who gave it to their kids to help, a little, little older, to help them understand their interest in psychedelics. So in a way, it has been a, a, a calling card across that divide of people who are really deep into this world and, and people outside who don't really understand it. And I think uh, that the book made everybody feel a little more respected. Is that your sense? Yes, partially. 
Okay. There's, there's, <laughs> What's there's, the other part? That, but then there's also you know like a seething undercurrent of of infighting and rage about how this narrative is going to play out in the media and who controls it and what is right and what is wrong. And you mentioned that this is a rhetorical strategy, and I think about this a lot myself because. Um, because you write for general audiences too. You write for Harper's as well as Vice. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and you know, reading through your book and thinking about how much criticism Leary receives, I think that one of the overarching ironies is that Leary didn't really do all that much of anything. You know, he wrote some books that probably not that many people actually read. He started some religions that I don't think all that many people actually joined. <laughs> he um, had a small elite group of people living in a mansion that not all that many people got to visit. But outside of that, he was propelled into the limelight by journalists. Journalists created Leary. Yeah. So to blame Leary for this media circus that would have been impossible without him being used as a tool to promote sensational stories, I think is a little bit unfair to him. And now the new way to talk about this is a scientific model, which I think is probably, in fact it is certainly more palatable to most audiences. But then I also worry if that, um, if it doesn't address the problems with the ongoing criminalization, with access to psychedelics because, um, you know, I mean, this is a whole complicated situation, but if these things are going to be made into pharmaceuticals, there's a question of will they actually become available to people? How expensive will they be? Who will control it? Who will profit? And, um, and if that's the only model that is being advocated publicly, uh, as opposed to decriminalization or something like yeah. that, it uh, potentially could create problems of its own. Yeah, well, there's several implicit questions in what you just said. Um, one is Leary, and Leary is an important character in the book, and he does get some blame for the, um, uh, the backlash. Um, the reason I thought Leary was important and didn't deal with, say, Ken Kesey, who was another important character in terms of spreading psychedelics in, in, on the West Coast, was that um, Leary began as a scientist, right? He go, comes to Harvard as a psychologist, very well regarded personality researcher and begins doing research and gradually loses that focus. Um, he, you know, he does some kind of silly studies um, and, and it blows up. And the blowing up of that, which is, I mean, he's at Har so he goes to Harvard, he's there for three years, two and a half years. Uh, his plan, he got this appointment there and then the summer before he was gonna go, He's in Cuernavaca and he's heard about these mushrooms that um, are psychedelic and he takes them, he gets a hold of them, he takes them and he has this amazing trip poolside in Cuernavaca and he says he learned more about the human brain and mind in four hours uh, on psilocybin than he learned 15 years as a, as a researcher and, um, and then when he gets to Harvard, he uh, starts the Harvard Psilocybin Project. And, you know, if you look at the, the studies, they're, they're not very rigorous. Um, you know, he's, he's giving psychedelics to a lot of people in his living room and then writing studies about administering psychedelics in a naturalistic setting. Um, and he, he is involved with uh, the Good Friday experiment, uh, although that wasn't his idea. It was a graduate student's idea, Walter Pankey, where they gave... They, they took 20 divinity students, they gave 10 of them psilocybin, 10 of them a placebo, and they're in the, the Marsh Chapel on the BU campus, and they want to see if they're going to have big spiritual experiences, and I think eight of them did. Uh, and then the, the, the 10 on placebos are just sitting there really pissed off in the pews, <laughs> but nothing happened. Um, and that was an interesting study, and it's kind of being reprised right now, right, at NYU and uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, so, I mean, is, was Leary a tool of the media? I, as often is the case, it goes both ways. Leary was addicted to the media. He could not resist the opportunity for an interview. There are ways to avoid becoming a tool of the media, and he, he didn't choose them. He, was, he, just, he just soaked it up. And, you know, was, I mean, I have a, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with him. I mean, I find he's a very endearing character in certain ways. His, 
his effervescence, his positivity, the fact that he's always, he can't hold a grudge. I mean, he is getting persecuted by the end, right? I mean, I, I tell the story of, I forget how many busts he had, like 32 busts. He escapes from jail with the help of the weathermen and he has to go to Algeria and submit to Eldridge Cleaver who has a government in exile and then Cleaver takes his passport and won't let him leave and he has to escape again and he ends up in, I mean, it's just, it's a fantastic, I don't know why the movie of Timothy Leary has not been made yet. <laughs> There's someone in the audience, this is, it's such a good biopic. Anyway, um, but again, if you're looking at things from the perspective of a scientific enterprise that beginning in the 50s is really promising and making very interesting discoveries um, and it gets derailed in the mid 60s. And at least the scientists all felt, the ones working there who tried to stop Leary from going public and telling everybody to take psychedelics, um, that he is, if you want to tell the story of the, the rise of the science and then the collapse of the science and the renaissance of the science, Leary is an important character in that, in that particular narrative. I forget the other, what did you say more at the end there? That question one? Then I got into a whole decriminalization thing. Decrim so we should talk about that, because yeah. I just published this op-ed piece, yes. which well, definitely to... pissed off people yes, in the did. psychedelic community. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so if you didn't hear, in Denver, three weeks ago, I guess it was now, or two weeks ago, uh, <laughs> Denver did, the voters of Denver did something very surprising. Uh, it was a very small campaign. I think they spent $25,000 on this campaign, but the opposition spent zero dollars. <laughs> and um, uh, they passed an initiative, it squeaked by, by about uh, 1,900 votes, that said, ordered the, it's not exactly decriminalization, but close, ordered the police department to make psilocybin crimes their lowest priority. Um, so psilocybin is still illegal in Denver, and of course you're still vulnerable to federal and state uh, charges. Um, not a lot of people were getting arrested for it. I think it had a lot of symbolic value. And uh, you know, as I've said in interviews, I, if I lived in Denver, I would have voted for it without question. I don't think anyone should go to jail for the possession or, or use of, uh, or cultivation of mushrooms. Um, but it, that's different than legalization, uh, and I was being, you know, sounding cautionary notes about that. I mean, it would be disingenuous for me, having possessed, used, and cultivated mushrooms, to argue that they should be illegal without submitting myself to, you know, arrest. It surprised me that you've cultivated them. You didn't write about that, did you? I did not. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> what species did you cultivate? Or is this not a, a uh, discussion? <laughs> But we can talk about it later. Okay. okay we, we don't want to get too technical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, but I thought, I, you know, I raised some questions about going further and using ballot initiatives as the way to do it for a couple reasons, um, which, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to briefly lay out. Um, so decriminalization, I support that. I support that with all drugs. Um, Legalization, I live in California and I've watched what happens. And one of the things that happens when you legalize something is that large corporations move in and not only are the drugs made available to people, but they're pushed on people. I mean, there is really aggressive marketing now. Um, when I come home from this trip and I go over the Bay Bridge, I'm gonna see three or four billboards for marijuana delivery companies that will have marijuana at my doorstep within two hours um, and, a, and a choice of products. and a lot of people I know in the food community are now making delicious foods with lots of marijuana in it. Um, and so, you know, I think, are we ready to have psychedelics marketed to us in that way? I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I tend to think that's not a good idea. And, but it and, won't be quite like that. It will be different. I think that, you know, I hope so. it's happened in other countries. Of course, it was Amsterdam, Amsterdam, the UK, Japan for a period. And in all of those cases, it wasn't being pushed on people, but it was openly available. And then there were problems, but again, this is the, the tricky thing about problems, is I think that the problems, the real problem isn't the problem, it's journalists jumping on the problem and making it into a story and blowing it out of proportion. Because what happened in Amsterdam? I mean, it was one French one case, right? named Gael Karoff, maybe took mushrooms, they're not even sure, and jumped off a bridge. 
and then that becomes a reason to... Right. It's like Art Linkletter's daughter. Yeah. Right? I mean, a single story that's never verified. Yeah, sure, we see this. I mean, this is the nature of the media. These are, these are definitely risks. But um, I think part of the, the, part of the problem is, is a lot of the activists uh, who are supporting legalization are treating psilocybin like cannabis. And I think it's a really different drug in many ways. How do you mean that they're treating it like cannabis? Well, it, this is the playbook. First, you establish it as a good medicine. That changes the image. You know, with cannabis, when we had medical marijuana, uh, suddenly it wasn't Cheech and Chong anymore. It was like Marcus Welby. And, and that made it possible to uh, start talking about legalization. And that, and that was the strategy. That was drug policy, you know, activist strategy. I remember they told, I wrote about, um, about legalization or, or medical marijuana in California after the proposition was passed in the late 90s. And they were very frank. They said, we're gonna change it, we're gonna make people think of it as a medicine first, and then we're gonna be able to move toward legalization. It's exactly the strategy they pushed. And, um, and I think a lot of people see the same thing. A lot of drug policy activists are working to support the research, hoping that that'll soften up the public for uh, more, uh, like legalization. Now, how is it different? Well, I mean, as you know, the experience is more consequential, more momentous. Um, I think more things can go wrong. I think there are people who shouldn't use psychedelics. Uh, I think people at risk for schizophrenia, the, the kinds of people who are excluded from the current studies. Um, I just don't think we're ready for it. I mean, I, I, I want to get there, and um, I'm hoping that you're right, FDA approval, and that's the path we're on. Um, and, and that's the path I'm worried will be compromised if we start having a big political debate about psilocybin, if we politicize it, which, which is necessary to pass uh, ballot initiatives or legislation, right? You have to make it a political issue. You're, then you then force politicians to take positions prematurely that they then get stuck in. And I, I wonder, too, what problem are we solving? I mean, are, are there a lot of arrests for psilocybin in this country? I don't think there are. One of the reasons it was so important to decriminalize and then legalize cannabis, as we've done now in 10 states, is that cannabis was, was the very foundation of the drug war. You can't have a drug war without illegal cannabis. And, uh, you know, we talk about mass incarceration, and cannabis had a lot to do with that. Many of the people who are serving long jail sentences because of three strikes, you know, how many of them uh, was one of those strikes a cannabis crime? So there was an important social justice reason to bring down the whole edifice of law around cannabis, or try to. Uh, and I don't think that's the issue here. So it's I guess I see us on this. Even, even if not a lot of people are getting arrested, it still plays a role in the way the experience plays out for the user. Yes. The very fact that it's illegal has some bearing on the nature of the experience. You're maybe you think you're doing something wrong. If you right. feel a little bit afraid, you get paranoid. you're that much more reluctant to seek some kind of professional help because maybe you'll get arrested right. or maybe your parents will be angry at you for committing a crime. I think that um, the the effect of this prohibition goes beyond mere arrests. It also interferes with research, it interferes with hobbyists that might want to cultivate some species right. of mushrooms. There's a, there's a lot of uh, things that- Look, I, I agree it's not a good thing, I, but I, and I think it's a fight we need to fight at some point. But in politics, not only do you, do you choose what, what you're gonna fight for, but you need to give thought to when are you gonna make that fight? And timing is very important in politics. And it just strikes me as premature. Now, there's another initiative in Oregon, which is interesting in a different way. And that the idea there, I'd be curious to know what you think, is not to decriminalize or legalize, but to create a state training and licensing of psychedelic guides who could serve anyone, whether they, they you don't need a diagnosis. And they're going to instruct, if this passes, the, the state medical board to set up this whole thing. And uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, I, I still, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I think about that. Uh, I still think the path we're on, which so far there have been no obstacles placed in the way of researchers and some companies now seeking 
approval from the FDA of uh, psilocybin uh, for depression and addiction and, and uh, these other indications. I think once that happens, it will be a lot easier to design a, a container or a way for uh, what one of my sources called the betterment of well people. In other words, all the people who stand to benefit from psychedelics who don't necessarily have a psychiatric diagnosis. So you think the pharmaceutical model is the... I don't know. I don't think that that is the pharmaceutical model necessarily. I, I think we need another model. I mean, I think we have... I, I see three models. We have the pharmaceutical model, and, that, and we're on that track. And, you know, it looks like in five years, seven years maybe, that, that it will be approved. And then on the other side, we have the spiritual model, the religious model, right? There are people in the Native American church and the ayahuasca churches have a constitutional right to use psychedelics in their worship. Um, and that seems to work fine. There's not a lot of controversy around that. And then you've got the rest of us in the middle. So how, what do you do there? And I'm not sure exactly what you do there, but I think in the same way you have those two other containers, a set of, of uh, protocols for the use of these drugs, we need to design one in the middle uh, for everybody else. And it may be related to the pharmaceutical model. I mean, I could imagine, like lots of people seek psychiatric help or, or psychotherapeutic help who aren't clinically depressed or, or clinically um, uh, anxious. They're just troubled and they, you know, they go see shrinks to, to work out problems. And you could, and many of them have a consulting psychiatrist who gives them meds. Um, and you know, you could see something like that happening, that there would be clinics and there would be some doctor involved and um, people who go there and, have, and wanna have this experience are checked out and they look at drug interactions and risk of schizophrenia and then they're, you know, given the experience. So that's one model. Um, and another model is simply decriminalizing it so people feel safe doing it on their own and growing their own mushrooms. I mean, the great thing about mushrooms is it doesn't take, I mean, it takes some skill. It doesn't take enormous skill, like compared to making LSD. Um, so, you know, I think it's what we have to work out. Um, but I look forward to a day when that happens. I mean, I found these experiences um, very useful. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about the natural world. I learned a lot about the mind. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I don't want to close the door behind me by any means by saying no one else should have this experience. That's definitely not what I think. It's right. just about tactics and strategy. Right, yeah, you, you mentioned in that New York Times article that you felt that the researchers should complete some research before we were ready. But my concern with a lot of the psychedelic research is that maybe this model won't work. Maybe these very promising initial studies won't hold up. I mean, this has already started to occur with the, you know, the findings that Griffiths had in terms of um, increased openness in a larger analysis. Those findings were no longer significant. Mm -hmm. Same thing had to do with um, some measure of, of spirituality. It was also not significant once they increased the size of people that they were testing. And with things like smoking cessation, the sample sizes are extremely small. It's like eight people. Yeah, they're, they're pilot studies. Yeah. But most of the therapeutic studies have had so far promising results. I agree. So let me just, I should tell the audience where we are on the therapeutic study of this. Um, the things, the most promising, I think, has been the, uh, and this is the first thing I wrote about, was giving psilocybin, guided psilocybin experiences, and I should explain what that is, to people who had cancer diagnoses, many of whom were terminal. And there were two studies, one at NYU and one at um, Johns Hopkins. And um, these are phase two studies. So it was about 80 people, I think, all together. And in two thirds of the cases, people had, uh, who had um, debilitating depression and fear and anxiety around their cancer diagnosis or, their, or the chances of recurrence um, had a, significant drops in their scores for depression and anxiety. Many of them lost their fear of dying. It was quite remarkable. Um, this was interpreted by the FDA and some of the researchers as a strong signal that maybe psilocybin is, would help with general depression. Um, I think that may be a mistake. 
um, because I think the depression of someone with a new cancer diagnosis is not the same as someone who's been depressed clinically for 10 years and may not have an existential cause the way that depression does and may have been depressed so long that their brain has been reshaped by being depressed. So I worry that a lot of resources are going into testing psilocybin for depression. Um, and depression is really, you know, can be really difficult to treat. So the other, so there are these depression studies underway. Um, and just to back up a little bit, the way this, this is, these drugs are not just, they don't give you a pill and you go away, right? This is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy so that you um, uh, are prepared very carefully by two guides who are professionally trained. They uh, tell you what to expect. They give you a set of flight instructions, uh, they call it, to tell you what to do if something really scary happens. And sometimes something really scary does happen. And that if you, um, if you think that you're dying or dissolving or um, uh, you know, going crazy, go with it. Don't fight it. Surrender. I mean, it's that kind of, you know, relax your mind and float downstream, as John Lennon advised. Um, then during the experience, they sit with you the whole time, and they don't say anything, um, but they, have, they offer a helping hand if you need to get up and use the bathroom or just a comfort, uh, comforting hand on your shoulder. Um, and then afterwards, the guides help you make sense of what happened. You have an integration session. So it's not just psilocybin therapy. It's, it really is a whole package. And, and that's a challenge, I think, to both psychotherapy and pharmaceuticals in that we're joining the two in a, in a novel way. Um, anyway, so the other thing to be used for is smoking cessation. And there's a much bigger trial underway now. Um, and uh, addiction, uh, there's an alcohol, alcoholism trial here in New York that's quite large, uh, a couple hundred people in it. And there is a, um, there has been a successful cocaine addiction trial at the University of Alabama. Um, and then there have been some interesting studies of other kinds of people, like religious professionals are being given um, psychedelics uh, in a very peculiar study going on at, here at NYU and uh, Hopkins. And they're giving it to people in every denomination they can get. They haven't been able to get an imam um, rabbis, no problem. They, they, were, <laughs> they were lining up. Uh, and, but they have priests and ministers in all denominations. I think they got a Buddhist or two. And I don't know exactly why they're doing this. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting information. And, and, other, and they've given it to long-term meditators. And, you know, there's been a lot of interesting work going on. And yeah, maybe it'll all blow up, and then we'll have to figure out plan B. Um, but so far, um, you know, these results, compared to everything else in psychiatric medicine, have been really impressive. The effect size in the, in the study of the, uh, the cancer patients was dramatic, far beyond what SSRIs got when they were approved, um, and far beyond a, a placebo. So, you know, I think it's really promising. Um, I don't think the depression studies will be as impressive as the, uh, the, the, these pilot studies, but I think it'll still be better than SSRIs. I think there's a good chance that it will be. So that's the, you know, that's the kind of spine that I was following in this work. And I found it, um, in addition to describing my own experiences, you know, that's how I felt I could shine the most light on it. But it's not the only book to be written on psychedelics. Yes. I look forward to yours. OK. <laughs> well, and, and I think you make a great and case. And I'll come back and interview you about it, OK? okay? That, that sounds fine. <laughs> Promise. OK. <laughs> and of course, I agree with all of this. You know, I'm, I'm a believer. I want all of this to be true. I want them to be legal. I want them to be medicines. I want all this research to have tremendously promising results. But I'm also extremely worried because I think if we look at them exclusively as medicines and don't emphasize just cognitive liberty, the freedom to do things regardless of whether or not they're medicinal. It would be like if somebody made music illegal. And instead of saying, well, it should just be legal, because why not just make it legal? It doesn't hurt anyone. Everyone said, oh, no, we can prove that it's a medicine. And then if it's a medicine, then then it's OK for everyone right, to use right. it. And look, it actually helps people with neurodegenerative diseases. And certain people with PTSD, if they listen to a certain type of music under very controlled circumstances, it can actually be tremendously therapeutic. We need to make this legal. But 
then it would cost money and the whole thing would be a mess and you would sort of neglect the overarching issue, which is why is this even controlled in the first place? And if the medical model works, fantastic, that's great. But what's happening with ketamine is you're already, it's, you know, it's been less than three months. Tell and people what ketamine is. Does, do people not know what ketamine is? I don't know what sort of audience this is. <laughs> am, am I, I imagine most people do, okay. Well, ketamine's a dissociative anesthetic that has been used medicinally since the 60s and more recently, probably late 90s, they found that it had a very impressive effect treating depression. It's fast acting in a way that SSRI antidepressants aren't. Um, it seems to work for people that have refractory depression that hasn't responded to other treatments. And it's, it's safe. And it's extremely safe. So, well, it's, yeah, it's pretty safe. Short term. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, uh, but so it was approved by the FDA in an intranasal spray called Spravato um, a couple months ago. And, and there's already huge arguments playing out in the psychiatric journals about, well, what if it's addictive? And how long will these treatments go on? And is it really safe? And, you know, and, and the reality, actually, as much as I like psychedelics, want ketamine to be available, is that it just squeaked by FDA approval. The yeah, results two were, out of the three studies weren't, didn't show much, right? Yeah, it was not, the results were not especially impressive. There were even some potentially frightening aspects of, um, there were more suicides in the non-placebo arm of the trial. So there were, there were some things that were a little bit off-putting about those trials, and people are already saying, wait, this was a mistake. We went too fast. We were guided by this medical idealism. We thought this was the right thing to do, which I still think it is. But uh, my fear is that something similar might happen with psychedelics, that we're all so excited that we're going to just put all of our eggs in the medical basket. And then the moment one of these trials fails, then, then we've invested everything in the idea that they're medicines, when maybe that wasn't really the purpose. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, part of the book is about the medical aspects, but obviously a lot of the book was about my exploration under the, the rubric of recreation, right? I mean, I, I worked with underground guides, and some of them call themselves therapists, but others are interested in other things. They're doing it for people looking for spiritual insight or development or personal development. Um, and that world goes on, and that world will go on whatever happens with these trials. Um, it's, it's thriving right now. I mean, there's a big underground, and, uh, and it's all over the country. I don't know how big it is, um, but it's on the order of, I don't know, one or 200 people, would you say? You think it's more than that? Underground yeah. psychedelic psychotherapy? Guides, yeah. You think it's much bigger than that? I have no idea. Yeah. Oh. Well, you raised an eyebrow so <laughs> high. I thought I was going to get information. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> I, well, maybe I know a little bit, but I don't know that much. Anyway, so I, I uh, you know, so I, I explored that world too, and that's where I went to go. I couldn't, I didn't qualify for any of the, the university trials. I mean, that would have been an interesting experience, but they didn't, either they didn't want me or I, they weren't studying healthy normals, which I flattered myself to think that was the category I was in. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, there is this vibrant underground, and, um, yeah, they would like to be more uh, recognized, and um, they would like to be feel less paranoid, definitely. And that's why Oregon is interesting, because that would bring the underground overground, because um, those people could get licensed. Um, and we, you know, maybe that'll happen. So, you know, I, I, I'm not I'm not putting all my eggs in that basket, um, but I think it's a really interesting basket. I, I mean, and the reason is that. Um, we have a mental health crisis in this country. I mean, it's, it's just one of the things this book has acquainted me with is the, is the scope and extent of suffering around addiction and depression and uh, anxiety. And I, I just had no idea. I mean, I've heard from hundreds of people who are uh, seeking psychedelic therapy, and there's a, a tremendous demand for something better than the drugs that psychiatry now has. Um, people are, you know, Antidepressants worked better when they were new, and even then they didn't work that well. Um, you know, they performed slightly better than placebo and got approved. And over time, their effectiveness seems to be declining, and, and people really hate the side effects, and they're very hard to get off. 
And in general, uh, psych psychiatry has very few good tools. The ones they have basically treat symptoms, not causes. And so psychedelic therapy holds uh, you know, enormous potential. It may not be realized, you're absolutely right. But one of the things that's also surprised me is the receptivity of um, psychiatry and mental health field in general that I thought I would get a lot of pushback from, you know, by writing this, you know, positively about psychedelics, but it's been the opposite. They're like, they want to get into this. I mean, I've seen so many uh, school, medical schools uh, and, and really good neuroscientists who now want to explore this area. And so, and I get it. It's, it's actually a, a, the result of a certain desperation um, because psychiatry is, is, uh, is really broken. And, um, and, the, and there hasn't been any innovation since the early 90s. Um, so anyway, I, there's a lot of hope in that. And you know, if that's all that happened that came out of this, that we could relieve some of that human suffering, I think that would be great. And just one more thing about Leary. Because we, <laughs> uh, we started talking about this. You know, the idea and the, the narrative that's presented in your book and sort of the conventional narrative is that he destroyed psychiatric, scientific research with his antics. Um, but one thing that I think is, is really complicated about all of this, and this is the kind of the, the double-edged sword aspect of the pharmaceutical model, is that in 1965, Sandoz, who were the major pharmaceutical impetus behind any medical research on psychedelics. They had patented both LSD and psilocybin, and they were going to be the company that, if any company, was going to bring these to markets as pills that could be purchased in pharmacies. It would have been them. And then in 65, before it was prohibited, before Leary even existed in the public, I mean, if you look up Timothy Leary 19, up to 1965 in the New York Times, he's not even mentioned, or maybe mentioned a couple times. He doesn't exist, essentially, outside of the small countercultural sphere. So they had already gotten frightened well before Timothy Leary existed, and they had pulled out That's right. this I capitalist support. So suddenly, not only is there they're not a major pharmaceutical supplier of the drug for researchers, the whole idea that this was working toward a new uh, psychiatric revolution where this would be a new tool, it could be purchased by doctors, kind of disintegrated with that. And, you know, you see this with What Cam year was it pulled? 65. It, almost 22 years exactly after Albert Hoffman first tried it. Yeah, but, but Leary had exploded into the national media in 63 when he gets fired from um, Harvard, and it was becoming a street drug. 65 is a big turning point. It's when the media turns against uh, psychedelics, too. Um, and there's, a, so, so I, I would disagree that, I mean, Leary was, um, you know, there were big articles. Uh, Andrew Wilde wrote a big piece for Look Magazine about, about Leary and that he was giving drugs to students at Harvard. And I mean, Andrew Wilde brought down Leary in many ways. And um, uh, so it was becoming controversial and Sandoz does what corporations do when something's controversial, which is, you know, try to protect themselves. Yeah, I don't know. And maybe... I mean, I'll say something very positive about Leary, if you think it'll help. Um, <laughs> um, and that is that, and this is Rick Doblin's line, um, that he created a world where psychedelic research could resume. And the reason is that he, because of him, so many more people were exposed to psychedelics, tried them in the 60s, and those people are now in charge of our institutions. Um, you know, I'm meeting with the head of psychiatry tomorrow at, uh, at Columbia, and, you know, he, he told me, he's actually written this, that his interest in the brain began with some psychedelic experiences, and, and uh, former head of the American Psychiatric Association, and, and um, I, was at a, I was doing a book event in D.C. last year, and somebody, uh, I heard somebody from the FDA wanted to come meet me, and I was a little nervous about it, and it turned out it was a psychonaut that works for the FDA. So we have Leary to thank for that. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I mean, he did some, it's weird, he, he gets blamed for all this psychiatric, all these psychiatric problems, but uh, if he ruined anything, it was First Amendment defenses of psychedelic drug use. I mean, that he did 
actually ruin because you know he was trying to claim that he, when he was arrested for cannabis that he practiced Hinduism and it was a part of his religion and he was protected by the First yeah. Amendment. And then there was a you know ruling that there was some kind of slippery slope argument. And if we if we allow him to practice his Hindu religion, then everyone gets to practice their Hindu religion. Yeah, it was a bad move, definitely. Yeah. So, and I do think that if it hadn't been him, it would have been someone else. I, I think that's probably true. Um, I, I think it, you know. What I was surprised to learn is it was becoming a street drug, so-called, in L.A. by 1959, because so many psychiatrists were using it in L.A., um, and it was Sandoz LSD, I think, and it suddenly was becoming a, you know, it was showing up at parties and things like that. So it was finding, it was going to find its way into the culture, and it was going to escape the lab uh, with or without Leary. But Leary gave it a real toss out, over the wall. Um, so anyway, I think journalists did. I think journalists are to blame for all of this. Uh, <laughs> journalists are to blame for everything. Come on, <laughs> let's take some questions. Okay, okay, okay. What if the question was about whether or not journalists are to blame? <laughs> I'll think you wrote it. <laughs> uh, in what ways do you think the world would be different if everyone had at least one experience with psychedelic drugs? Oh wow. That's a really interesting question. So there is a, uh, an idea. Well, let me, let me back up and, and approach this another way. One of the things that has really struck me about psychedelics is that they seem to address what I regard as the two biggest problems we face as a civilization. Um, that is the environmental crisis and tribalism, OK? And, um, and here's how. I mean, one of the very common responses to a psychedelic experience is this new understanding of the natural world and that you feel connected to nature in a way you don't ordinarily or most people don't. Um, this is, uh, you know, and, and this has been tested. I mean, I don't know how much you want to believe in these psychological scales, but the, the psychologists have a scale for nature connectedness. And um, how much do you feel part of nature and how much do you feel away, you know, out of nature? And because, you know, we're a weird species. We have a relationship to nature. What other species has a relationship to nature? They're just nature. And, um, <laughs> but in, uh, in England, they tested this and they found that after a single psychedelic experience, people's nature connectedness scores went up. Um, their tolerance for authoritarianism also went down. Um, and, this stands to reason because one of the things that happens is that the whole world seems more conscious. Um, the other people seem, you feel more connected. The, the, the defenses, I think, the ego, the ego formation of consciousness, which, which is what allows us to objectify the other and allows us to objectify nature, um, that goes away or it gets more permeable. And um, so it, in some ways, it, it's exactly the drug we need. The challenge, of course, is how do you, how do you drug a whole civilization? <laughs> this is not fluoride, right? Um, we're not going to put it in the water. The CIA may or may not have experimented with that, but it wouldn't work, because I think wouldn't the solar energy destroy LSD? And certain chloride would, yeah. Oh, the chloride would. OK. So, <laughs> so well water would be OK. Um, but anyway, we're not, that's not what we're going to do. That's not the way to do it. So there's been this argument in psychedelic circles going back to the 50s. Do you try to democratize the experience and give everyone the experience, as the questioner is suggesting? And that was Leary's approach, basically. Uh, you know, turn on, tune in, drop out, or tune in, turn on, drop out. Um, he wanted everybody to have the experience. And, and then there was a counter argument Aldous Huxley, you know, being the most important exponent of that, but several other, all the researchers, I think, in the 50s, which is give it to the elite, give it to the, the, the masters of the universe and, and the, the people in government and the church, and there was, and there was an effort to do that in the 50s, and, and hopefully the new consciousness would filter down to everybody else. Um, I don't know what's right. I mean, in a way, we're pursuing both strategies, I guess, right now. Um, and I don't even know that giving it to everybody would have the desired effect. I mean, people emerge from the experience in a lot of different places. I mean, this ego-dissolving experience has produced its share of egomaniacs. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's very unpredictable. And, um, 
but that wish is there and that, that general kind of hunch that this is, this is really useful to a civilization in crisis. Um, so I don't know the answer. What do you think? Well, the fact is that a lot of people have used psychedelics. I mean, depending yeah. on what demographic you look at, it's maybe somewhere around, you know, it depends on the age and the state, but up to 50% of the population. Really? Uh, yes. So. And look how fucked up things are. <laughs> <laughs> So there goes that theory. You know, and you know, someone like Alexander Shulgin, who's a wonderful man, and his wife, Ann Shulgin, who's still alive, you know, they use psychedelics. They both smoked cigarettes. She smoked cigarettes until, I think, three years ago. Um, he drank. They both had divorces. I mean, they were human beings. It didn't turn them into right. superhumans that had no flaws. And this is why I think that the music analogy is almost a closer thing than the medical one, because it's like, what would happen if everyone didn't listen to music? I don't know. It would be worse. It would be yeah. unfortunate. You would have a little bit less richness in your life. Um, would it necessarily make you a better or worse person? It's hard to say, but you still want to have the ability to do that. Right, right, yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah, but that, I mean, that, that battle goes on, I think. You know, elite versus popular. Yeah, okay. This is a good What one. else you got? What are your profit strategies? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> what are your profit strategies for the future of psychedelic medicine? You know, uh, sell books. Uh, <laughs> that's the only game I've got going. I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I can't, I can't, I'm not going to invest in any psychedelic companies. I don't sell psychedelics. Uh, I have the usual writer profit strategy. Um, there are other profit strategies out there, as you know. There are companies getting into this space. Um, there is one pharmaceutical company uh, in England, Compass, that is uh, hoping to bring psilocybin to market. They've raised a ton of money, in, especially in Silicon Valley. And uh, they're very controversial in the, in the community. Extremely, that, yeah. Extremely, yeah. And um, people feel that they're trying to control things and that they are um, uh, very suspicious of their motive. And this is something that worries me about, about Compass because I can already see all these things coming down the pipeline. Like if they treat psychedelics like any pharmaceutical company should, they'll do things like alter them, which I think is good from a chemical pharmacological perspective. I don't think that psilocybin is perfect. I think you could maybe modify it in certain ways that might make it better for certain therapeutic purposes. Maybe. Or just make it more IP, right? I mean, well, that as well. like ketamine has been altered slightly, basically so somebody could own it and charge a lot of money. And that could happen to psilocybin too. But it also shortened the duration. Yeah. So there's a reason. Oh yeah, no, there was. And yeah. well, yeah. We can talk about that later. Too. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm trying to bracket like really technical conversations. Okay. Uh, there's some, some pretty basic ones here. But That's okay. Okay. Don't be afraid of basic. Okay, okay. Are these <laughs> drugs addictive? No. Okay. No, I mean, that's a real, uh, there, there, there are two very striking facts about the, the so-called classic psychedelics. This is, um, you know, LSD, psilocybin, DMT. I don't know if I can say this about mescaline or not. You tell me if I'm wrong. But that they're, they're, there's no lethal dose. Um, no LD50, as they say in, in pharmacology. And that's really striking because you've got drugs in your medicine cabinet you bought over the counter without a prescription that have a lethal dose in the dozens of pills. Um, and uh, they, that doesn't happen with psychedelics. Um, the other thing is that they are non-addictive. If you, if you create those experiments where you've got the rat in the cage and it's got two levers and one administers cocaine to the bloodstream and one administers glucose, food to the bloodstream, and the, and the rat will press the cocaine lever until it dies. And heroin too, until it's addicted. Um, you put LSD in that setup, the rat will press that lever once and never again. <laughs> and so it's, um, rats don't like LSD, we can, we can conclude that. Um, so that's very striking. The risks are not physiological. Um, the risks are psychological. Um, and, and practical. I mean, the fact that you're, you know, your judgment is disabled and you might walk into traffic or do so something like that. Um, but the risks are that you have uh, panic attacks. Uh, some people have had psychotic breaks. People at risk for schizophrenia can be tripped into the schizophrenic state 
Um, that can also happen on cannabis and alcohol, though, too. And there's some debate whether it was going to happen eventually anyway. So, so the risks are psychological. And there was a, a bad trip survey done, I think last year or two years ago at Hopkins, and um, they asked people about their bad trips, and that's a real phenomenon. And um, something like 8% of them had sought psychiatric help uh, in the wake of a very difficult experience. So. Talk about microdosing. Yeah. <laughs> When I, when I wrote about food, I always got the GMO question. That's just a command, not and, a question. Yes, I know. <laughs> so microdosing. I didn't dwell on it in the book because my focus was following the science, and there's really not much science uh, on microdosing. The science we have are, is a very interesting collection of anecdotal reports that have been gathered by a psychologist named uh, James Fadiman, who enrolls people informally, and they, they microdose, and they report back what happened. And a great many people report improvements in mood, productivity, creativity. It's very popular in Silicon Valley and beyond. I was, I was going on a TV show that I won't name the other morning, and one of the people at the table said, hey, I'm microdosing. Um, <laughs> and, but we haven't done the, the controlled, you know, placebo-controlled, uh, blinded trial. Um, and supposedly there's a company who has done some of that in England now. But the, the real test to see, is it really the, the small dose of LSD? And basically how it works is you take uh, 10 micrograms of LSD every third or fourth day, um, and, uh, but we haven't done that with a placebo to see if it really is the LSD that's giving these, opinion, these, these feelings, or is it a placebo effect? And frankly, the placebo effect with psychedelics is really strong. There's so much magic imputed to these molecules that if someone thinks that, if someone takes so, any amount of LSD, they're, they're likely to feel something. But, right, absolutely. I mean, this is a thing that people say, oh, you can tell that it's not placebo, but many of the clinicians in these experiments mistake Ritalin for a psychedelic experience. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so that's, the, that's the research we need to do. It's a little hard to do because, uh, I mean, it should be easy. It's very straightforward. But on the other hand, getting it through an IRB, uh, in, Institutional Review Board, you're going to give people LSD and then let them get in their car and drive away? Um, that's challenging. Do you find it at all obnoxious, all this microdosing stuff? I'm starting to find it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> a little, I, a little bit much. All the discussion. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, you know, to me, there's something that violates the spirit of psychedelics and microdosing. I mean, here's this, this incredibly disruptive drug in in the best sense. It makes people question their assumptions, their frameworks. It's, it has the potential to change culture and change mental health and. And, and here you're just turning into another productivity drug. <laughs> you know, it's, it's what capitalism would do with psychedelics if it had free reign, you know? Right, yeah. it's, it's making psychedelics non-psychedelic. Yeah. And then everyone's it's, very it's, excited. Exactly, it's, yeah, exactly. It's neutering, it's neutering. It's turning it into another supplement. It's a brain supplement. I, I know, I feel the same way. Um, I hope it works. I mean, it'd be wonderful it does. If, you know, there are people who, who say it's, um, you know, Ayala Waldman wrote a whole book about how it, you know, helped her with her depression. And, um, uh, and even if it is a placebo, great, you know. I mean, we could ruin it by finding it doesn't work, um, right? I mean, the placebo might not work as well. That's interesting, I wonder. I think it would still work fine. Well, they say that even a sugar pill, if, if someone, if you say, here's a sugar pill for your, the pain in your knee, it will work in, in a certain number of people, even if you say it's a sugar pill. The placebo effect is kind of wild. And, and I think that, as one of the researchers said to me, um, uh, psychedelics are placebos on rocket boosters. That's an interesting idea. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I had, I had a question. I think that you know, throughout probably the entire recorded history of psychedelics, every generation has tried to explain the experience and often tried to explain it scientifically, although in some societies that wasn't a possibility. So you have Aldous Huxley in the doors of perception giving this kind of like, oh, it's uh, mescaline is interfering with glucose metabolism in the brain, therefore mm -hmm. psychedelic experience. And, uh, and then you, know, you have people saying, oh, the 5-HT2A receptor, that explains it, or the 1A receptor, or, um, and now 
the new thing that, that is the hot explanation, of course, is the default mode network. So do you think that the default mode network really explains it? Is that a satisfactory explanation for you? I think it's not definitive by any means. I think it's really interesting. Um, it takes us further. It takes the story further than the, the 5-2A receptors. Um, and, you know, I think the important thing to always keep in mind is we don't know anything really about the brain or very little about the brain. And, and, and the relationship of the brain to the mind is, is still, I mean, I was really, you know, this was my first foray into neuroscience as a writer. And, and I assume, like most people, that consciousness is the product of brains. But, you know, the Dalai Lama is right when he said that's just a hypothesis. Um, you know, we don't know this. So there's a lot we don't know. Um, the default mode network theory is interesting. It's the idea that there's this one network in the midline that connects the prefrontal cortex to the uh, to deeper, older centers of memory and emotion and the posterior cingulate cortex, and and it is deactivated on psychedelics. And um, you know, and this is based on fMRI imaging, which is imperfect, right? Um, it's a proxy for activity in the brain. And um, this was surprising to people because they thought that. Um, that psychedelics appeared because of all the fireworks it produces in your sensorium, that everything must have been activated by it. But in fact, there was a deactivation, and this was really surprising. Um, the default mode network is, in, is involved in things like self-reflection, theory of mind, the ability to impute mental states to others, um, the autobiographical memory, how you create, the, you know, it's where you create the story of who you are and incorporate events in your life into that narrative and time travel, the ability to, to, to project yourself in time and, and uh, travel in time, which, which you need to have an identity, right? I mean, without memory, you, you don't have an identity. Oliver Sacks has shown that. And so to the extent the ego has a home, it, it seems to be in that, in that set of structures. And, uh, and it's really interesting, I think, that they are deactivated. Is that the whole thing? And we don't know. And how do you get from... Uh, activating the 5-2-A-R to the, the, the di diminishing of activity in the default mode network. We don't know. They talk about a cascade of effects, which is neuroscience speak for don't know yet. Um, so, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm excited by that theory. I think it's really interesting and it has some explanatory power, but that's all it is, is a theory. Yeah, I agree. Okay. <laughs> there's not, I mean, there's some, they're, they're very specific. They're like, my son has this problem, what should I do type questions? Yeah, so I'll, I mean, I'll, let me just address that. I mean, because I do get lots of um, uh, requests for referrals to guides, and for obvious reasons I can't do that. Um, it's too risky for the guides. They would assume anyone I introduced them to had been vetted in some ways, but I can't do that. And so it would put them at, at jeopardy. And, and it's, it must be very frustrating for people who've who thinks that psychedelic therapy has something to offer their, you know, their, their children or their parents, um, and um, you know, but I, I think that you've got to find your own way. Um, I do offer some advice uh, or some suggestions on my website. There's a big resources page on psychedelics. Um, so, for example, there are now 120 psychedelic societies around the world. Um, they've they've sprouted up everywhere just in the last two or three years. And I think, and these are not places where people use drugs, but they go to talk about them and share their experiences and talk about the new research and things like that. And my guess is if you spent some time at some of those meetings, you would find your way to some people who knew some people in the underground. Just a guess. Um, also, a lot of the ketamine therapists, um, not the new style using the nasal thing, but the old style, which is legal. Ketamine therapy, off-label ketamine therapy is legal. And that that community, at least on the West Coast, is very closely plugged into the underground community. Um, and then you do what we journalists do is, you know, I just asked everybody I knew. Um, and then finally someone said, well, I have a friend who worked with someone in the South Bay and I think they did psilocybin and well, could you ask them? Could you put me in touch? And, you know, you, I, I think you can find your way. And go to Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> I think they're more in Brooklyn than Manhattan. What do you think? And, and more in Brooklyn than the Upper East Side, for sure. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think, you know, trying to figure it out on your own, that's my, my take on this. Yeah. As much as you possibly can. 
because I, I, I wouldn't trust these groups. I don't you wouldn't know. trust them? I wouldn't. I haven't and wouldn't. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Why not? Because it's a very personal experience to volunteer to someone who you don't have, you know, I trust just a close friend more than I would. Yeah, so that's another approach, is, is doing it with someone. There's, a, there's a, a wonderful book called The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide by James Fadiman, which is, if, if you're going to have a guide who's kind of more of an amateur, um, that's, I think that's a really good um, set of instructions for how to go about it. But I'm talking about a professional guide. And I interviewed a bunch, and, and frankly, I wasn't comfortable with all of them. There's some I thought were a little crazy, and there were others I thought were a little too cavalier about something that was pretty momentous for me. They didn't kind of honor my fear. There was one guy, um, this Romanian guy, who I said, so what happens if someone has a heart attack? What are you going to do? And, and um, you know, what if someone dies? And he says, you bury him with all the other people. <laughs> like... <laughs> He wasn't the guy for me. <laughs> I mean, in a way, yes, that's what you do, but I want him to call 911. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. I was with one guy, and he was, uh, and I was saying, it was before I was trying 5-MeO-DMT, and I was saying, you know, I have these concerns because a, a friend of a friend actually died very recently, and, uh, and you, know, it's, you know, that is a risk. And he's like, oh, that was so terrible when that happened. You know, no one expected that because he was the son of a shaman and he had, you know, this lineage, and I was like, son of the shaman, it's, it's, no, my friend is someone else, and he's like, oh, there was another death just recently, so I was like, oh, this is really just like a bad way to get into this experience right now. <laughs> Set uh, and setting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we should take one more? One more, okay. Damn, these are very specific. These are just like <laughs> medical questions. Uh -huh. Can someone... You can also, do you want to read something, or is it, have we gone on for so long that that would, that would be inappropriate? I don't know. Do we have time for, read a short passage? Uh, yeah. So uh, sometimes I ask audiences if they, I'm, I haven't talked about my own trips, um, and sometimes I ask audiences, do you want to hear a good trip or a bad trip? And audiences always say, bad trip, right? So speaking of 5-MeO-DMT, this is a, a very, to me, exotic psychedelic to you, maybe run of the mill. Um, <laughs> it's the um, smoked venom of the Sonoran desert toad. You've got to give props to a species that could figure that one out, um, that you could smoke the venom of this toad. And don't worry, no toads are harmed in the making of the psychedelic. They're, they're gently squeezed, and they squirt this venom out, and you catch it on a glass, a sheet of glass, and then it, you dry it, um, overnight it dries, and it looks like brown sugar, and you smoke it to get rid of the toxins. And you take one puff, and um, here's what happened to me. This is just a couple, couple pages, and then we'll wrap up. I have no memory of ever having exhaled or of being lowered onto the mattress and covered with a blanket. All at once, I felt a tremendous rush of energy fill my head, accompanied by a punishing roar. I managed barely to squeeze out the words I had prepared, trust and surrender. These words became my mantra, but they seemed utterly pathetic, wishful scraps of paper in the face of this Category 5 mental storm. Terror seized me, and then, like one of those flimsy wooden houses erected on Bikini Atoll to be blown up in the nuclear tests, I was no more, blasted to a confetti cloud by an explosive force I could no longer locate in my head, because it had exploded that too, expanding to become all that there was. Whatever this was, it was not a hallucination. A hallucination implies a reality and a point of referent, reference and an entity to have it. None of those things remained. Unfortunately, the terror didn't disappear with the extinction of my eye. Whatever allowed me to register this experience, this post-egoic awareness I'd first experienced on mushrooms, was now consumed in the flames of terror too. In fact, every touchstone that tells us I exist was annihilated, and yet I remained conscious. Is this what death feels like? Could this be it? That was the thought, though, though there was no longer a thinker to have it. Here words fail. In truth, there were no flames, no blast, no thermonuclear storm. I'm grasping at metaphor in the hopes of forming some stable and shareable concept of what was unfolding in my mind. In the event, there was no coherent thought, just pure and terrible sensation. 
Only afterward did I wonder if this is what the mystics called the mysterium tremendum, the blinding, unendurable mystery, whether of God or some other ultimate or absolute, before which humans trem tremble in awe. Huxley described it as the fear of, quote, being overwhelmed, of disintegrating under a pressure of reality greater than a mind accustomed to living most of the time in a cozy world of symbols could possibly bear. Oh, to be back in the cozy world of symbols. <laughs> After the fact, I kept returning to one of two metaphors, and while, while they invariably uh, deform the experience, as any words or metaphors or symbols must, they at least allow me to grab, grasp hold of a shadow of it and perhaps share it. The first is the image of being on the outside of a rocket after launch. I'm holding on with both hands, legs clenched around it, while the rapidly mounting G-forces clutch at my flesh, pulling my face down into a taut grimace as the great cylinder rises through successive layers of clouds, exponentially gaining speed and altitude. The fuselage shuddering on the brink of self-destruction as it strains to break free from Earth's grip while the friction it generates as it crashes through the thinning air issues in a deafening roar. It was a little like that. <laughs> the other metaphor was the Big Bang, but the Big Bang run in reverse from our, own, from our familiar world all the way back to a point before there was anything, no time or space or matter, only the pure unbounded energy that was all there was then before an imperfection, a ripple in its waveform caused the universe of energy to fall into time, space and matter. Rushing backwards through 14 billion years, I watched the dimensions of reality collapse one by one until there was nothing left, not even being, only the all-consuming roar. It was just horrible. <laughs> I don't want to leave you on that note. <laughs> one last point. Something that um, uh, happened right after that was you come down. It's the best thing about this trip. It only lasts 10 minutes believe it or not. And I came, I came down and I, I started feeling that I had a body. Oh, I have a body. And, and I felt the floor and there was matter and I could feel time going by. And I was so grateful at the reassembling of the known world and the dimensions that, you know, we've all expressed gratitude for being alive, I hope, at some point. I had gratitude that there was anything uh, and not nothing. So, um, so in the end, there was this positive side to it. Um, so anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. And the book is great. It thank really you. is great. That's very kind. Thank you. I just want to say that uh, you all have a signed copy of the book in your lap that I used a very special ink tonight. <laughs> no, don't lick it. Don't lick it.